Good evening, brothers and sisters. We welcome you to our Sunday evening devotional. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to gather together, especially as we prepare for this week where we celebrate the independence and freedom that we enjoy in this great country. What a great way to be able to start off this week and are grateful to be able to, to be together this evening. I'd like to thank Brother Newville for the beautiful prelude music which he has provided for us. He will be our um, organist for our music. We'll have an opportunity to, to sing. Uh, his wife, Sister Newville, will be our music director. We'll sing hymn number 338, America the Beautiful, to be able to start off our experience together, followed by an opening prayer by Sister Deborah Storm. Our beloved Father in heaven, we humbly come before thee, so grateful for this day, for the Sabbath, for the opportunities we've had to strengthen our testimonies, renew our covenants. Father, we're grateful at this time to be gathered, to be strengthened and edified. We're grateful for this country. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to 
celebrate its freedoms. Father in heaven, we pray that we might be able to see beyond confusion and chaos and recognize the great blessings of this great nation. Father, we understand that with these great blessings comes responsibility. Help us to understand how we can best be good citizens of this nation. We love thee, Father. We love thy son. We pray now for thy spirit that we might hear and feel those things that thou would have us understand. We love thee so much. For these blessings we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. What an opportunity to be able to sing together and think about God's grace and his goodness on our great country. It's a beautiful way to begin. We'll have some opening remarks and the introduction of our speaker by Brother Dennis Levitt. So we'll invite him to, to go first. Brother Levitt will be followed by Brother Gov Allen. We'll go to that point. Dennis. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here. I'm amongst friends without question. In my personal life, I'm a husband and father and grandfather and a member of the St. George, Utah Snow Canyon Stake. So I feel comfortable standing right here. Um, and in my professional life, I'm the president of a nonprofit foundation called United We Pledge. United We Pledge, uh, Sister Storm, I really appreciated your prayer. You prayed specifically that we might celebrate, and you prayed that we might learn or be educated or uh, inspired. Um, those are, we have a threefold mission. One is to educate, one is to celebrate, and one is to have a destination place where good things can happen in St. George. I was fortunate enough uh, several weeks ago to meet Gov Allen. I think he reached out to me, actually, and we hit it off. I had a chance to visit him at his work. Um, he's, he's a professional teacher, and in addition to that, he has a hobby as a colonial printer. Uh, he owns some great printing presses from the 1700s era, in essence, and is going to help us in this celebration that we're doing here in St. George leading up to this Independence Day celebration. So Gov has been kind enough, I said, gosh, would you come down and speak to us? And he said, well, if there'd be 10 or 12 people there, I'm happy to come and speak at least. So Gov, we've at least got a dozen here for you. I'm not great at math, but I know there's at least a dozen here for you. It's fantastic. That's good. Um, education and celebration and destination, again, like I said, is what we're about, and I just wanted to highlight a little bit of the things that are going on here in Washington County in the next week or so. Uh, if you're from Utah County, and I know some of you may have been or lived there at one time, you know that there's something there called a Freedom Festival. It's more than a week-long celebration now, but it focuses in significant ways on independence. Because of that, we have a vision in St. George that we ought to follow suit that the 4th of July ought not to only be about fireworks and watermelon eating and that sort of a thing, but that we really have a responsibility, especially living here in Washington County. The county's named after George Washington, of course. Brigham Young uh, established this county as a last kind of bastion of strength in case um, the government were to come in and do what they did to us in the Nauvoo era. There was kind of this plan by President Young in order to make sure that the saints, is, the saints' rights were protected. So St. George has always kind of been this last frontier or this last stand by design. And then in addition, you know that the founding fathers, we believe, appeared in the St. George Temple and asked for their ordinance work to be done. For those reasons, we feel very moved upon in order to make sure that in St. George, we're not forgetting the constitutional values and the freedoms that we enjoy and that we do everything that we can to promote and preserve those in a really important way. So while we're early on in our efforts, it won't be too many more years until what happens in this county feels a lot like what happens in, Wash or in Utah County, where we really make a major focus for this. There's a new campus being built in Hurricane, Utah. I don't know if you can see that very well. We may even just hit a light just for a second. It, um, the Howard family's here, Lex Howard, he's the CEO of Balance of Nature. They're, they're building a 160-acre campus in Hurricane um, called Balance of Nature Gardens. They've um, donated property, about 40 acres almost, to Unite We Pledge in order for us to build an American-type campus focused on American ideals. We call it Liberty Village, and Liberty Village breaks ground uh, on that campus 
this upcoming Saturday, July 2nd. We're excited about that. But this is going to be a place where youth and others can go in order to learn about our traditional American values of faith and family and freedom, where they can learn about the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. It's inspired by another campus just south of Birmingham, Alabama, called the American Village. And there they bring about 110,000 students annually to that campus in order to help educate them and take them, kind of transport them back in time. The buildings are exact replicas of some of the important buildings in America's history. And interpreters, actors and actresses, stay in character so that youth can have conversations with them about what happened in that era. It's really a great place to walk down the street and be able to have a conversation with George Washington or, or Abigail Adams or Jefferson, right, to have those kind of conversations in replica buildings that model the streets of where they would have been. So we're excited for this groundbreaking that's coming. And part of that celebration and education will include this destination that United We Pledge is building. So as a calendar, there's a Liberty Village groundbreaking on July 2nd. We have a Colonial American historical exhibit uh, that's what Gov's going to help us with, as, as well as a gentleman named Glenn Beck and Ron Fox and Brent Ashworth. Some of America's great historical collectors are bringing together some of their um, artifacts as well as documents and art in order to help us in St. George recognize and realize that those kind of things ought not to be forgotten. We don't have a lot of youth here tonight, but when, when we think in terms of what we're trying to do, it's really for those three guys on about six rows back. We're trying to protect their generation, and one other guy right over here, about seven or eight rows back, right? But we're trying to protect their generation so that the ideals that, that we grew up with are simply not lost. In addition, there's a prayer for religious freedom in the tabernacle. Um, next Sunday evening, we've uh, brought speakers in and musicians in from across the nation. And then finally, there's a Fourth of July celebration that used to just be a country western concert and fireworks show. And we said, well, we're actually going to change that. We'd like to add an hour to that show and do a real tribute, a, a tribute to America. So with that, um, that's one of the reasons that I, I've invited Gov here to start this week off with us uh, in order to make sure that in this county we remember where we came from we remember the documents that are so important in our historical foundational um, beliefs and in those things that we need to preserve. And then um, we're going to just continue on in order to teach and expound in every way that we can. So I'll introduce you to Dr. Gov Allen, a professor of information systems. Yes. I could give you the times of those things. Groundbreaking is at 9 a.m. The exhibit is a three-day exhibit. During the entire time the tabernacle is open, they're open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's in the basement of the historic St. George Tabernacle. Uh, the prayer for religious freedom is next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. And then the 7 p.m. show happens at, at um, Utah Tech University. I think that's right, right? That's how you say it now. Utah Tech University at Greater Zion Stadium next Saturday starting at 7 p.m. Yeah, that's right. So Gov um, has a PhD in information and decision science from the University of Minnesota, 2021, 2001, sorry. He's the past president of the Colonial Heritage Foundation, a public charity that sponsors the largest American colonial living and reenactment event in the Western United States, the Colonial Heritage Festival. It's on exhibit four days a year, always around July 4th time, right? And that's where he takes his 1700 1700s printing press as well as other exhibits that now are going to become permanently housed in the Liberty Village in Washington County, Utah in the coming years. Um, I hope you'll all be nice to Gov tonight because he told me he retires from teaching two years from now and when he retires from teaching I really want to have him move here and help us build this colonial village in a permanent way. So please if nothing else tonight just treat him with the utmost respect and kindness in every way so that two years from now he's a member of the St. George Utah Snow Canyon Stake. I would say that I'm grateful for the founding fathers, the men and women who sacrificed for this country. I've been a student of scripture for my entire life and career. 
I've read the scriptures over and over and over again. Some of you come to classes that I teach every Thursday night in buildings like this. I love the scriptures and I love our founding fathers from the religious era of our lives. I could easily, if Gov didn't show up tonight, you were going to get a lecture on anything from Isaiah to 1 Nephi to whatever we would have kind of found our well, way talking through. But since I was asked um, by Lex Howard, a dear friend, to take this role on of this nonprofit foundation, I found myself immersed more in the reading of American history and of our founding fathers. I do want you to know that I know that they were inspired of God. I do know that this nation has a responsibility and a destiny. I'm grateful to learn tonight about what we can do in order to further that destiny. And I'm grateful for brilliant men who spent their lifetime studying those things so that those of us who are novice can really learn our way through as we try and establish and strengthen the foundation here in this county. I know those things to be true and share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God. Thank you, Dennis. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here tonight. I, uh, my university doesn't normally like me to say, you know, exactly the name of the university because it suggests that they somehow endorse what I'm saying, but these are my own, my own thoughts and my own research. We'll just say that I uh, work by day at a large religiously sponsored university located in Provo, Utah. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and I teach, we might think that maybe, you know, this guy probably a history teacher or something, but I actually teach information systems. So like database management and computer programming and often on the first day of class, I'll start off by asking my students, I'll say, so what does it mean to be an American? You know, and they're, they're like checking the syllabus and making sure they're in the right place and everything. And, and um, you know, they're kind of shy to answer there at the very first uh, of class. And then they realize, oh, he's, he's serious. You know, he, he wants an answer. And so almost always the first answer that comes out is it means you're a citizen of the United States of America. And that's true in one sense. But in our language, we have... Uh, an expression that there's not an analogous expression in most, for most other countries, and that is un-American. Uh, it means something to be un-American. It, th th it's not an expression un-Mexican or un-Irish. Those are not terms that they use in those cultures. And so I'll, I'll, I'll push and I'll say, well, what does it mean to be American in the opposite sense that it means to be un-American? A long, awkward pause. And then, you know, they finally realize if we're ever getting to database management, we're going to have to answer this question. And almost always, the first... Re re thing that comes up is it's something along the lines of there's a, we have a shared belief in liberty or of freedom, and that is absolutely right. That has been something that has defined our people since before we were um, a, a separate nation. I mean, just, just even as part of the British colonies in North America, we had the shared understanding of freedom. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm going to share with you a little bit tonight about how we ended up having that. It's a, we had a very different feeling about freedom than our, our European progenitors did, and, and either the other Europeans who were alive, you know, at that time in the 18th century, were very, very different. The culture, in fact, our culture was so different, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll end up going to war because we can't understand why those folks in England are being so unreasonable, and they can't understand why we're being so unreasonable, and it's because we have such a different culture that we perceive the same, the same events very, very differently. Um, but, but liberty was one of at least seven different values that really defined American culture and made American culture different from European culture, uh, different from just English culture in general. Uh, and of those seven that we started off with, and there may, be, there may have been more, there's seven that I've kind of identified and think, yeah, this is, you know, this is really what made us different. Um, there's only two of them that we still unite around today. And so when I push my students and say, okay, shared belief in liberty, right, what else? Nothing else comes with any degree of regularity. They'll come up with some pretty good things, but there, nothing happens. I, can, I, I can't count on any one of those other ones showing up on any given semester. The other one that I think we haven't lost is uh, justice. So let me kind of take these two, justice and liberty, as ones that we still feel as part of our, of our national identity. How did we end up feeling so differently about liberty? So it turns out that most of the British colonies in North America started off as commercial endeavors. You say Jamestown. You know, Jamestown's the first permanent colony in North America, or first one to kind of make it. What was Jamestown here to do? You know, what were, they, were they coming over here to, are they here, you know, what, we want to somehow populate North America? No, they're here to find gold. That's what they're here for. It is, uh, the, the um, Virginia Company is an offshoot of the London Company, and they are here to find gold. For 100 years, England has been watching Spain 
bring back a, a fleet of treasure ships every year full of gold and silver, and they get the feeling gold is everywhere in North America. You just have to go over and get it. In fact, the biggest problem that Jamestown had when they first were getting established is that they were having trouble getting people to do the kind of work that it would take to sustain them because they're too busy looking for gold. It's like there's got to be gold around here somewhere. You know, let's go find it. That's what we're here for. Uh, and so, um, so, so not all of them, but most of them start as, as these commercial endeavors. They're here to make money, and one by one, they fail. And the, and the crown kind of says, well, we've got this foothold here in North America. These folks over here kind of counting on, you know, some connection back here with the country. And the, the crown kind of reluctantly takes these colonies on as royal colonies. So they're now no longer managed by whatever company, the London company that started them up after they failed. They now, you know, are under the management of the crown. And the crown realizes at this point, this is not a money-making proposition. And so we end up with a policy that won't get named until the 1770s of salutary neglect. It means we are, we are neglecting the colonies, but it's, it's, it's because we love them. In fact, one of the great supporters of America in Parliament, and there weren't very many, uh, was a guy named Edmund Burke. And he's trying to argue, we've got to quit trying to oppress the colonies in North America. Um, let's just keep doing what we've, do, what we've been doing. What have we been doing? Nothing. We pass laws over here that says, you know, Americans, you're only allowed to trade with England. And you know what? They ignore those laws, and they trade with everyone. And that is, and Burke says, that's fantastic, because they get rich. They've got all kinds of money that they can buy English goods with. Let them keep doing that. They'll make us all rich. Um, he was uh, not quite a lone voice, but almost a lone voice. You know, he'd make these great impassioned pleas, and then the things that he's arguing for will get defeated 34 votes to 187 or 234 or something, you know, little, kind of these large spreads. We look at the arguments he made today, and we think, wow, how could anyone vote against that? Well, they could. And so, but it was this idea that it cost, uh, the feeling was, as long as you don't cost us anything, you can do whatever you want. So, in 1619, when we get the very first representative body, the House of Burgesses just kind of springs up. We need to somehow organize ourselves. Parliament's not making laws for us that deal with the things we really need to have, have dealt with here. Parliament kind of says, wow, they just made a representative body. We hadn't, didn't ever expect them to do that, but whatever. You know, they didn't, they didn't try to stop them. They just kind of let it happen. And as a result, for 150 years, more in some cases, we got to thinking that that was normal. That, that for us to be able to just decide what we're going to do, that that's normal. That's not normal anywhere else in the world. And so as a result, we think that's our birthright, to have this liberty. And after the, after the French Indian War, when, remember, the, the idea was as long as you don't cost us anything, you can do whatever you want. The French and Indian War was crazy expensive. And so England now says, okay, you're costing us you're not going to get to do whatever you want anymore. We're going to get serious about collecting these taxes. It worked pretty well. For 100 years, they'd levy taxes. We'd ignore them. They'd send someone to enforce them. They'd find out it costs more to enforce the tax, and they'd get by enforcing the tax. They'd stop enforcing the tax, and we'd move on. We thought that was the way it was supposed to be. And so um, when, after the French Indian War, they start to pull back this liberty, we said no. Uh, and we thought that was something worth fighting for. And so, so from that time... To this day, we have felt that liberty is part of what it means to be an American. Um, uh, similar with justice. So justice was something that we, we, felt, really, we felt really differently about. And, and part of the reason is, is that when the colonies were established, they got a charter, like a paper, you know, kind of set up with a king's signature on it that says, you're a colony over there. And, you know, these are kind of the rules. Well, when these colonies came under, um, you know, instead of, under the management of the corporations, but under the management of the crown. And as parliament starts to think, you know what, we think we want to change the deal, parliament would just make a law that changes what, that just changes the deal. And we said, wait a minute, we have a charter that says how we're supposed to run over here, and you can't just change it. As a result, we start being really interested in the law and in justice and being very kind of serious about it. In fact, kind of at the same time, when Edmund Burke in parliament is trying to argue that we lay off the colonies, he says, listen, my fellow parliamentarians here, you don't understand. He says, almost everyone in America is a lawyer. Now, he's exaggerating here. Um, but he says, in no other country is the study of law more prominent. It's in America where we first get people who, who try to make their career in the law. We think John, John Adams is one. So um, kind of before the era of John Adams, if you 
practice the law. It was something that gentlemen did in their spare time. You know, it was really rare for someone to say, what's, you know, what's your occupation, what's your career? It's a, it's a, it's a, a they would call it a barrister uh, or a solicitor, but a lawyer. Um, really unusual. But here in America, we think, yeah, I guess that's a way that you could make a living. Um, and uh, he says, not only that, I'm informed by prominent booksellers here in London that they sell more of Blackstone's, the, uh, Blackstone's commentary on the law, which was the main legal book of the day, they sell more of those in America than they do in England. And we're printing this book over here. And in fact, the Americans, they start printing it on their own. They're printing it over there without our permission, but they're just printing it and using it themselves over there. And, and, and what he's arguing is that these Americans are serious about the law. And if you guys just pass something that isn't like really sound, they're, they're going to find holes in it. They're just going to not do it because they'll know that it's not legal. And so, we, so and, and this is another one. So, so when, I guess the point that we can kind of see that we still see this as a national value is that when we see someone or we hear someone who's acting in the name of America doing something that is clearly unjust, we have kind of a national response to it. When we find out that our government is holding people in a, in a prison without the prospect of a trial, a prison they couldn't even build in America, they built in Cuba, we, we say there's something wrong with that. There, there, we don't, maybe we don't know what the answer is, but that's not right. And the reason is because it's a violation of a shared national principle that we still hold. So these two, liberty and justice, we haven't lost. We've never lost it. Now, that doesn't, that's not to say that America has always acted according to those values. There have been times when we've done things, as I just mentioned, we've done things that you know, we think, wow, that, that kind of violates that principle. But there's a response in the nation when that happens. Um, but there's at least five others that defined us and made us who we were by the 1770s that, that said, oh, yeah, that's, that's part of our culture that we no longer see as part of our culture today. And so what I'd like to do with the rest of the time is, is kind of raise your awareness about these other five values. Um, convince you that they really are values that defined us as Americans. Um, and you probably won't need to, that much convincing to, to understand that they're not part of our national, part of what it means to be an American today. But hopefully as, you're, as we're kind of coming into this time of where we really think about um, the founding of our nation to think, wow, that's what I could do to be a great American is to kind of re-embrace fully the set of values that made Americans who we were in the 1770s at the founding of our nation. The first of these, what I refer to as the lost founding values, then um, goes by a term, in fact, most of them go by terms that we don't use in our national uh, discussion anymore. The term is divine providence. So we ask people today, educated people, what, what's divine providence? And they'll, they'll get the word divine and they'll say it's got something to do with God. And that's about as far as we get. And, and they're right, it does have something to do with God, but it's, it's not just a belief in God, it is a belief in a providential God, a God with a plan. A God who is concerned with the affairs of nations and intervenes in the lives of men and women. Um, and in fact, this shows up in our, I mean, in our founding document. I mean, this, this term shows up in the Declaration of Independence. Most people, well, the vast majority of Americans have never read the Declaration of Independence, which I think is absolutely absurd since it's our founding document. It's one page, you know, it's an easy read. Maybe it's not an easy read, but it's a short read. They're familiar, but they're familiar with, with three sentences. They're familiar with the first sentence. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, they, they think, okay, yeah. We ask them where that's from, and, and they'll say it's from the Constitution. We'll give them credit for it. It's a founding document. It's the wrong one, but we get it. They're familiar with the first sentence of the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident. They sell de they'll say declaration on that. And they're familiar with the last half of the last sentence. We mutually pledge to, our other, to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And that's because they heard it on National Treasure. <laughs> but, but this value shows up in the first half of that last sentence. So if we kind of look at the structure of the Declaration of Independence, we've got a couple of paragraphs at the beginning that kind of lay the groundwork, and then we have 27, 28, depending on how you count grievances, that we lay at the feet of King George. He's done this and this and this and this, and for all these reasons, we're going to declare our independence. And then we declare our independence. We have the language that comes right from the Virginia Convention that these free, that, the, or that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, right? We've declared our independence. And then we get this kind of conclusion where we say, and, this is the sentence, and for the support of this declaration, this declaration that we're free and independent, with a firm protection, with, uh, let's see, and for the support of this declaration, relying firmly on the protection of divine providence 
we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So this idea of divine providence, of this belief in a providential God, um, that, was, that was part of what it meant to be an American. If we kind of go back and look at the, the various kind of attempts that we had to unify the colonies, I mean, usually, and the first time we really did it was 1774 in the First Continental Congress. This is the first time that we get the language used generally that is the United Colonies of America. We had an attempt back in 1754, the Albany Plan, where we're trying to unite the colonies, again, not against Mother England, but we're, we're having trouble on the frontier. And it turns out the Indian nations, they're way more coordinated than the colonies were. Uh, up until the 1770s, the colonies saw themselves as individual competitors for royal favors. So they didn't want to work together because they were competing with the other colonies to get uh, favors from the king. But we go back to the very earliest, uh, kind of the very earliest attempt that we had to kind of get a union of the states, and it was actually the United Colonies of New England, 1640s, where you know, they're saying, yeah, we're going to get together kind of for our own mutual defense here out in the, in the wilderness. And in that, it, it, kind of in this plan for the United Colonies of New England, they say, here's the things that you know, we all agree on. And the first thing that they say in the, the paperwork for this, this union is, all right, we all came here so that we could establish the work of God. And this was the reason that we're here. And so from our very earliest time of our founding, this sense that we're here to accomplish the work of God has been part of what we believe in, part of what it means to be an American. Um, uh, today, uh, more, definitely more so than, um, than it was felt in England or in the rest of Europe. Um, these folks left their homes, came to a new world to be able to worship the way that they wanted to worship and to put forth the work of God. Today, we, we don't feel that that's part of our national identity today. I mean, the good news here is that if we kind of compare r religious beliefs in America to religious beliefs in Europe, we ask a you know, survey, anonymous survey, you know, do you believe in God? About 20% of people in Europe will say, yeah, 15 to 20%, I believe in God. In America, it's about 80 to 85% of people will say, I believe in God. Um, but, and, and so we can kind of see that there is some sense that there's still a difference there, but we no longer see it as part of our national identity. We really do believe that someone could be an atheist and be a perfectly good American. We, we, there, there's no, there's no and, and there shouldn't be any kind of religious test for citizenship in the United States of America. But what I am saying here is that when the vast majority of Americans believe that, uh, that there's a God who's concerned about what I do, that America is a better place to live. In fact, when we think about divine providence, in fact, it was probably uh, none of the founders talked more about divine providence than George Washington did. In fact, a, a letter uh, that he wrote to Samuel Langston in 1789, kind of right as the Constitution is being ratified, um, he says, the man must be bad indeed who can look upon the events of the American Revolution without the warmest regard for the divine uh, providence of God that was so often manifest in our behalf. Uh, and he will talk over and over again when it seemed as if the war was over and then the hand of God would intervene and um, be able to save the army so that he could uh, live to fight another day. Um, and he laid those miracles at the feet of divine providence, at the feet of God. Um, but it's not just this divine providence in the sense that God's going to intervene and do stuff. Kind of the second way that divine providence acts is that there's some responsibility that we have to help bring forward the work of God in the world. And so when we really do embrace this ideal of divine providence, part of what we do is we seek out actively what is it that God wants me to do in this world. Now, we all have leisure time. Uh, in fact, we ask in our culture today, we ask someone, what, what does leisure mean? And we'll get two R's. It means relaxation or it means recreation. That's not even remotely close to what the term leisure means. I mean, if we ask, you know, what is leisure time? Leisure time is you have a certain amount of time that it takes to put food on the table, keep a roof over your head, and keep the wolf from the door, to just to get by. All the other time you have in your life is leisure time. So, so leisure time is what you have left over after what it takes to get by. And in our culture today, we think that is synonymous with relaxation and, and, and recreation. Um, but one of the main things that you will do with your leisure time, if you really embrace and understand divine providence, 
is you will say, part of this time I'm going to use to find out what does God want me to do and work to accomplish the work of God, to find out what your divine mission is and to work to accomplish that. So that's kind of the first of the, what we refer to as the lost founding values is this divine providence. Second one is very closely tied to that. And again, it's a term that we don't use anymore. The term that the founders used was private virtue. And so today, for us, that means the kind of the closest term we have for that today is individual morality. Um, and in fact, the connection between liberty and virtue is a really fascinating connection in, as we look in the writings of the founders. Um, for the first thing is, that listen, if we live in a, in, a, in a regime where we are compelled to do what God wants us to do, there's, there's no virtue there. You can't, you, you, you can't expect any eternal reward for that because it's not a free will offering, right? For, for you to offer your will to the Father, it's not a free offering if you're compelled to do it. And so a fundamental reason why we embrace liberty is so that we can make the free will choice to serve God. That's a big part of, of liberty. But, the, but the, the reverse of that is true, is that if we, if we give liberty without virtue in the people, then that liberty will be abused. This is exactly what we are wrestling with at this moment in our, in our country with, um, with, the, with the questions about rights for abortion. It is, are we going to have freedom in the absence of personal morality? And that's something that our founders would say that's absolutely absurd. You, you, you just can't long sustain freedom if you don't have private virtue. So private virtue is this sense of, of doing the right thing even when no one's looking. Now, today in America, I think most people still feel this sense they should do the right thing. But it's often now connected to whatever religious upbringing that we might have. Um, but that's not where the connection was at the founding of the United States of America. So if we look at the French Indian War, 1750, it starts in 1755, um, starts out very bad for the British. Um, we have, in fact, by this time, General Washington, he's actually Colonel Washington, is retired, 1755. He's retired from military service. He, his plan is to live out the rest of his life as a gentleman farmer uh, there in Virginia. Uh, and then the French Indian War happens, and he thinks, oh, you know, Edward Braddock is coming over. Um, Edward Braddock is the one that um, Great Britain sent over to convince the French we're really serious about this. Uh, very successful, uh, kind of old school, European general. And uh, Washington kind of signs up to go fight uh, with him. Anyway, um, the first engagement with Braddock is known to this day as Braddock's defeat. The name of the battle is Braddock's defeat. It's also known the battle of the Monongahela. Uh, but it is the worst British military defeat in history, period. The point is, that, uh, and that the whole story is fascinating. I wish I had another 30 minutes or so to kind of just dive into that story. But the point is, at the beginning of the French and Indian War, the war is going really badly for the British. So badly, in fact, that in Virginia, they're not able to meet their quotas of militia to kind of sign up to go and actually fight. And so um, that's, the, that's the problem. Folks, and the feeling is, eh, the war is so far away. If it comes closer, maybe we'll sign up. Well, that changes almost overnight when a man by the name of Samuel Davies um, gives, a, gives a sermon. And he actually gives this sermon on the occasion of a few of these folks who have signed up to go fight in the war. And when I first read about this, I thought, well, how could it be? I mean, first of all, who even listens to a sermon? And how could just one sermon you know, really change the minds of people on a broad scale? And the reason is, when you had a good sermon, you didn't just give it in one place. You kind of gave it over and over again. And if it was good enough, printers would get a hold of the text and they would print it and sell it with or without your permission. You know, and so this is like popular reading of the day. So um, his, his sermon is called The Curse of Cowardice and in it he lays out the argument why you have a God-given responsibility to fight to defend your country. And uh, he did, which he does, just, he does this masterfully. And then he gets to the end and he, makes, he, may, he reminds us something in this space of private virtue. Um, that I want to uh, tell to you because you kind of see the connection between divine providence and private virtue. This is not something new that he's exposing to these folks. He's reminding them of something that they already know. So he's gone through this whole, he's been going at it for about three hours now, and as a normal um, sermon length of the day. Um, and, and he says, here I thought to have concluded, 
Have you ever had that happen? You know, and the, the guy or the person's given the talk, maybe in church, in conclusion, and there's like 10 more minutes before he actually sits down, and you think, you know, I think that's what happened here. Here I thought to have concluded, but I must take a few minutes more to ask this crowd, is there nothing that can be done by those of us who remain at home towards the defense of our country and to ensure the success of the expedition now at hand? He says, shall we sin on still impenitent and incorrigible, should we live as though we and our country were self-dependent and had nothing to do with the supreme ruler of the universe? He said, can an army of saints or of heroes defend an obnoxious people ripe for destruction from the righteous judgments of God? He's reminding us that for God to be able to intervene on our behalves and fight our battles, we have to qualify for that. And we do that by living a life of private virtue, making the right choice even when no one's looking. Not because we're Presbyterian or because we're Congregationalist or because we're Anglican, but because we're American. That for God to help our country, we have to qualify for that. And so, and again, this is one that, uh, that, we've, that we've lost. We don't see that as part of our national identity anymore. I... <clears throat> Briefly, I'll tell you the kind of the story that I kind of realized this on. I was watching a, a movie long after it came out. It was probably only about 2005 that I kind of rewatched this again, but it was from the 1990s. Uh, a movie called The Rocketeer. Any of you remember this one? It was a Disney movie. Yeah, some of you saw this one. Anyway, in this in this movie, kind of the whole tension is is that we've got it's during World War II, and and um, uh, Hughes Aircraft has invented a rocket that you can strap to the back of a person and they can fly. You know, and this is going to change the war, but the Germans are after it. And they've hired kind of local organized crime to go and steal this rocket pack. And the, kind of the whole tension around the movie is, is that we're, we're, um, we're trying to recover the pack, which gets stolen and then gets lost and then recovered. And for the whole movie, we have the head um, organized criminal, a guy by the name of Eddie Valentine, um, kind of fighting back and forth, trying to capture this this rocket pack from the main federal agent who's trying to recover it. And uh, they spend most of the time pointing their guns at each other, you know, trying to recover it. It has, of course, fallen into the hands of the man who will become known as the rocketeer, who will use it to save the day and get the girl and so forth. But, but there at the climax of the movie, we find out when, the, when, the, when Eddie Valentine realizes unbeknowingly, un, unknowingly he's been working for the Germans, are the ones who are really you know, paying him for this. And when that happens, you know, he kind of switches sides. He's now trying to recover. And we see the federal agent and Eddie Valentine kind of side by side, now both pointing their, their guns at the German, and the, the, the Germans, and the federal agent kind of looks at him. This is a man who's, um, in terms of private virtue, none. He's a career criminal, right? He looks, kind of looks at him puzzled. Why are you helping me? And he says this. He delivers this line. He says, I may not make an honest buck, but I am 100% American. And you kind of have this patriotic sense of pride, you know, and you just think, yeah, he's 100% American. And what doesn't happen in that moment of the movie? What doesn't happen is there's nothing in your mind that goes, wait a minute, that's, that's wrong. How could you be 100% American if you totally violate one of our identifying values of private virtue? You don't feel that, and it's because we don't, we don't see it as part of our national identity anymore. So, um, so that's private virtue. Second, so we have uh, divine providence, private virtue. The third one that I want to talk about is, uh, was probably the first one actually to arise in America. And it's a term we don't hear uh, very often anymore. It's called what we would call um, the American work ethic. Um, I was kind of surprised last year to see in the Wall Street Journal um, that that term appear in the title of an article in the Wall Street Journal. But the question was, is the American work ethic dead? That was the, that was the title. I thought, oh, yeah, maybe it is. I'm not sure. So um, how does the American work ethic, you know, kind of arrive? And why, does it, you know, why is it different than the European work ethic? And it all kind of goes back here to uh, Virginia, to Jamestown Colony in Virginia. So Jamestown comes over here, they're looking for gold. Problem is, there's no gold. And so, um, but the investors have dumped all kinds of money into Jamestown, and they're looking for a return. So what do the folks over here in Jamestown do? They figure, I, we've got it. We're gonna make glass over here. I mean, glass is pretty, it's pretty expensive stuff to buy, you know, blown glass, you know, kind of glassware goblets and things. 
Um, and the problem is, is that it takes a lot of fuel to make glass. And by this time, England is almost entirely deforested. We've cut down all the, all the trees for building ships and for burning wood. We've only recently discovered that there's coal. There's lots of coal in England, but we didn't realize you could burn it until you know, pretty recently. So there's just no, there's no, we, look, we get over here to Virginia and there's these huge old growth hardwood forests. They think there's all this fuel. Great, we're gonna use this fuel. We've got sand, sands everywhere over here. We're gonna make glass and we're gonna send it back, but they can never get their kilns working right. They have to, and ultimately they can't be profitable at that either. It's not until they find out that there's a plant that grows really well here in Virginia that they'll pay good money, money for in Europe. What is it? Yeah, tobacco. It's not, even, it's not even local tobacco. Local tobacco, apparently, is really bad tobacco. This is from South America. Um, John Rolfe brought it up here. It grows great. They think this is gonna, this is gonna be it, and it is. It's gonna make Jamestown financially successful until the, they overproduce and the price of tobacco collapses. But the, here's the problem. It takes a lot of people to cultivate tobacco. And there's, there's no people. I mean, there's not many people over here. Um, by the way, the local inhabitants, uh, the Indians, they're like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. And so they think we've got to figure out how are we going to get people to come over here to cultivate tobacco. Here, can you imagine? Go back to the investors. All right, investors, we just got to come up with enough money to send a lot of people over here, and we're really going to make some money this time. I know the third time's the charm, and you know it's going to work. There's no more money coming. Ah. <sighs> But if we look at the societal structure at this time, most of Europe is in the feudal system. In the feudal system, we have about 5% of the people own the land. Uh, and their, 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 their responsibility is to protect everyone else. So these are the nobles. They, um, they own the land. If some invading force comes in, it's their job to repel them. Um, we've got about 5% of the people who are the clergy. You know, so their job is, you know, we've got 5% of the nobles, their job is to fight. We've got 5% of the, of the population that's the clergy, their job is to pray. And we've got 90% of the population, their job is to work. They work the land. They don't own the land, they work the land. Um, you, you can't, it seems so strange to us that you can't buy land. You cannot buy land in Europe. Land, it, it changes hands only by inheritance. And by the way, if you, um, you know, have two sons, which one gets the land? Can you split it and give it to both? Only in the region today that we call Germany was that allowed. Everywhere else in Europe, no, no, no. You gotta, you gotta give that land to one person. And the whole reason is, is that we don't wanna split the estate because the king wants to work with a small set of nobles. And if the estates keep splitting and getting smaller and smaller, it's too many nobles to work with and it's difficult to manage. And so this is the way that society is organized. But you, can you imagine, so there's lots of folks in England who know how to work the land. You can imagine the first recruiting posters, come to America. We'll give you the same deal you get in England. You can work for me for your whole life and never get anywhere. By the way, we don't know if we're going to have enough food to make it through the winter, and the local inhabitants could rise up and kill us at any moment. You know, no one takes that deal. <clears throat> but, so feudal, feudal societies, as, as I described, but in the beginning in the 1400s, we started to get another group, and that's what we would call merchants, where we said, listen, if, you, if, if your father, if you were the second son, the third son, your father had money in addition to land, he could outfit you with a ship, and you could go to sea, and you could make your fortune. Well, by the 1600s, we have a whole class in England and in Europe called the merchant class. They're fabulously wealthy, second-class citizens because they can't own land. Um, the land went to their older brother. They can't own it. They really, really want land. They've got money. They want land. Virginia says, Virginia Company says, Oh, we've got land. And by the way, you guys already have ships. Bring some people over here. We'll give you land. In fact, we'll allocate 100 acres for every person you bring over. 50 of it goes to you the moment they step off the boat. And if they die before their seven years are up, which they'll collect the other 50, the, the individual will collect the 50. But if they don't make it that seven years, then Mr. Merchant, it's going to go to you. So the merchants are like, yeah, this is a great deal. But now the deal, the same as the deal was before, come over here and work, you might, you know, the, the chances of you living long enough to collect about 50%, and yeah, it's gonna be rough. But if you make it that 50%, you'll become a land owner. There is no other path to land ownership than inheritance. So for these folks who are born as serfs, as the ones who work the land, there is nothing they can do with their labor to improve their lot in life. That's different in America, and it's the only place in the world that it's different. Now, in America, if you come and through your own labor, you can become a landowner in seven years. And if you continue to be industrious, you can buy more property, and you can become kind of a great landowner. You can improve the life for, your, for yourself and your family in a single generation. 
And it's all because of your work as a result. Work takes on a very different character in America. We see work as something that's noble. Whereas in, in uh, Europe, if you work, it is a sign of the lowness of your class. And there's nothing that you can do to change that. And so I remember I was watching uh, Harry Potter, the first, the first movie of Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And in it, a Malfoy, maybe you're familiar with the characters, Malfoy and Harry uh, get caught dueling, and their punishment is detention with Hagrid in the Forbidden Forest. And when Malfoy finds out that he's got to go and, and work, his response is so indicative of the way, to this day, the way that labor is viewed in most of Europe is, he says, no, that's servant stuff. I mean, we're going to have to go and work with Hagrid. He says, that's servant stuff. I say, that's, that's beneath my station to have to go and work. Um, and, but here in America, we feel really differently about it. And so that's, you know, that was, you know, so, so that's like another one of these. Now, we lost it today. Let me give you the feeling here. Here I was. Uh, my first professorship was at Tulane University in New Orleans. I'm trying to get to know the members of the ward, or the branch, actually, that I was in in New Orleans. And so I'm talking to this guy. He's nine years old. Like after sacrament meeting, he's headed off to primary. Um, what do you say to a nine-year-old? What's your name? How old are you? Where do you go to school? You know, what grade are you in? That, that's, after that, yeah, that's it. I'm closed. We're out of questions. Go to primary. <laughs> and uh, oh, no, I asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a public assistant. I had no idea what a public assistant was. I thought it sounds very noble, but a public assistant. And uh, he goes to primary. And the second counselor in the branch presidency was within earshot of that conversation. And I looked at him and said, what's a public assistant? And he said, he means he wants to be on public assistance. And I was just completely floored by that. I mean, to think that, that like, welfare is a career aspiration now. Um, absolutely amazing. And you'll, you, you know, you'll see this too. I mean, you'll agree with me because from time to time, you'll see you know, some expose on the news about someone who's taking advantage of the welfare system. They're, they're using food stamps to buy shrimp and other things that we, you know, lobster and whatever, things that we can't afford um, you know, on the money that we earn. And we'll think all kinds of bad things about that person. But you know what we won't, we won't say in our minds? We won't say, wow, that's really un-American because we don't see it as part of our national identity anymore. So, divine providence, private virtue, work ethic. Um, divine providence, yeah. So the fourth one then is a very different feeling about education. Um, in America, we believe that everyone should be able to read and write. When we say that, when I say America, I mean British colonies of North America, 1600s, uh, particularly in New England. We think that everyone should be able to read and write. That's crazy. What percentage of European population can read and write? About 10%, the clergy and the nobility. About 10% can read and write. Here we think it should be everyone. Why? Why do we feel differently about it here? In the 1600s. What's that? It's no, it's not. Well, yeah, that's, that's like the 17, middle 1700s were there. Yeah, yeah, it's because we want everyone to be able to engage the word of God for themselves. That's the reason. It's for, it's, we want you to be able to read the Bible. Uh, and so that's, that's why we feel strongly about this. As a result, by the 1770s, about 95% of men in urban areas can read and write at least at a basic level. For women, it's about, they're about 20% behind, so about 75% of women. If we go into rural areas, those numbers shift again by about another 20%, which means anywhere that you went in, in America, British colonies of North America, if you're free, you, you, most of you can read and write. Um, th th there's no other place in the world, with, with the possible exception of Scotland at this time, where the literacy rates come even close to that. By some measures, it is the most literate society that the world has ever produced. For example, when I lived in New Orleans, I was shocked to find out that the literacy rate among adults in the greater N New Orleans area was 48%. That most of the adults in New Orleans were, in New Orleans were illiterate. Those statistics may have changed dramatically after Hurricane Katrina, and I'm not sure what it is today. But they used to have a thing called uh, radio for the blind and print handicapped, you know, where they would just like read the newspaper over the radio. That's what it is. Even the comics, you know, here in this, you know, here Calvin now is eating a sandwich and in comes Hobbes, and that's how they would, they would kind of go through it. Um, and so we, we still feel very strongly about education today, but it's really different feeling about education. If we kind of go back 
um, to the um, 16, 1700s, we say, wow, there are more universities per capita in the British colonies of North America than anywhere else in the world. And who are these folks? I mean, who, who fills the roles of these colleges? Well, first of all, to be admitted to Harvard or to Yale or to King's College, now Columbia, William and Mary, you've got to already be able to read Greek and Latin. I mean, to, to start, you've got to be able to read uh, those because what are we doing? You're studying the classics. You're, you're, you're reading Homer. Um, you're, you're doing, you know, are, are, is this job training? No, these folks are farmers. There's nothing about how to plant and when to harvest. It's all about a, what we call a classical liberal arts education. Uh, and and this, this is the kind of, edu I heard someone say something about liberty over here. Uh, this is the kind of education that it takes to be able to maintain liberty. Um, in fact, Jefferson uh, had a very nice, it, it's kind of come to us as a little couplet. He said it a little bit differently. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it the way that we, that we say it today, and then I'll give you the full text of it. He says, the people that expect to remain ignorant and free wants what never has been and what can never be. Kind of nice, it flows, it rhymes, and so forth. But what he really said was, the people that expect to, to remain ignorant and free in a state of civilization want what never has been and what can never be. So the founders understood that we have to be educated to be able to maintain liberty. The good news is we still feel pretty strongly about education here in Utah. One third of every tax dollar that you send to the governor goes into education. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest element that we spend of our, of our tax money, but it's a really different kind of education. We ask kids as young as fourth grade, why do you go to school? In fact, I was given this talk uh, in, a, in a different setting and there was fourth grade, really unusual for there to be fourth graders in the audience when I'm talking about these things. And there are some fourth graders here and I thought, it's risky, but I'm gonna ask him right here, why do you go to school? Please say the right thing, right? And uh, the, 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 without missing a beat, because I wanna get a good job someday. That's right, that's, that's right. That's what they'll say, that's not the reason they go to school. Why do fourth graders go to school? Their mom makes them go to school. That's the reason they go to school. But we've trained them at that young age, the reason you need an education is to support liberty? No, it's to be able to get a good job. We see education as job training. Uh, uh, and in fact, when you think about that kind of liberal arts education, this one that the founders felt so strongly about, uh, it's actually become a punchline. I was reading in one of my favorite books, The Bathroom Reader. Have you, have you heard of it? Is it? Anyway, various things that you can read in a short time. You know, in one page it was just like, here's a bunch of bumper stickers. You know, reading bumper stickers. And, uh, you know, one of them was, I have a liberal arts education. Would you like fries with that? <laughs> you guys laughed. That's not funny. I mean, it's a punchline, right? But yeah, we, we, we don't value that kind of education that our founders thought was so strong, so, uh, or so important to maintaining liberty. So you know, if, if there's something you could say, you know, what can I do to be a great American? It is, um, you, you probably didn't have a liberal arts education, but it's not too late. Um, the, read the classics. So spend some time you know, engaging in with, with the great minds of antiquity. Okay, the last one, and we're gonna go over by just a couple of minutes. So, the, so um, divine providence, private virtue, work ethic, liberal education. The kind, by the way, when we say liberal education, liberal arts education, it's the same root as liberty, right? It's the education it takes for liberty. Uh, the fifth and final one, of all the five, this is the one that I'm most concerned about because not only do we no longer see it as part of our national identity, but we've become disconnected of it from most, most of us have become disconnected from it on an individual level as well. The term that the founders used was public virtue. And you might think, well, I know what private virtue is, doing the right thing when no one's looking, public virtue must be doing the right thing when people are looking, that's not what it is at all. It's gone from our discussion, our national discussion, we don't even understand the term anymore. Um, Benjamin Franklin was a loyalist until 1774, where he thought we've gotta get back together with England. In early 1775, he writes a letter back to one of the main loyalists who's still in his hometown of Philadelphia, <coughs> um, Joseph Galloway, uh, and in it he says, he's, he's He's kind of partially making up his mind to switch to be a patriot, and at the same time, trying to convince Galloway, who's a strong, who will never change, by the way, but he's a, a strong loyalist. He, said, he says this in the letter, when I think of the corruption that exists among all orders of men in this rotten old state, he's talking about England, he's writing from England, and I consider the glorious public virtue so prevalent in our rising country, I cannot but apprehend more evil than good from a closer union. He's now saying, I think we need to separate. And, he, and, and the argument that he puts forth 
is the corruption that he sees in England versus this public virtue. What is he talking about? I'll tell you a quick story to get to the heart of public virtue. 1775 is a great year for the American Revolution, for the American side. 1776, not so much. Um, it's, it's one loss after another after another. Washington, by December of 1776, Washington has 10,000 men in the Continental Army. About 6,500 are fit for service, and most of them go home January 1st. Their enlistments are over, and it's been a bad year. Morale is really low. They're not signing up again. Washington thinks, we've got to do something to change the morale here and um, to get these guys to sign up, because if they all go home, I've got no army. The, war, the, the war's over. The, the, the revolution is done. Uh, and that's when he makes the decision to attack Trenton. You're familiar with the Battle of Trenton, even if you don't know it by name, because this is the one where you get the picture of Washington crossing the Delaware, right? You know, he's standing up. In the, he's not standing in the boat, by the way, but he's standing in the boat. They got the flag with the stars. That flag hasn't been made yet. A lot of things wrong about the picture, but you know, the, you know what I'm talking about, right? In this, he's going he's gonna to cross. He can take 2,000 men. He's going to cross the Delaware. He's one of three groups that's supposed to attack Trenton together. His is the only group that makes it there. Um, and, he, and his hope is, if we can have a victory, then I'll get these guys to be able to sign up again. And so uh, if he wrote in his journal what his highest hopes were for the next day when they attacked Trenton, he would not have come anywhere close to what actually happened. It is the most lopsided victory in the American Revolution on either side. Um, two Americans will die, but they will die. They will freeze to death on the way over. Yeah, none will die in the battle. Uh, and they will kill about 125 Hessian soldiers and take captive another 800 Hessian soldiers. Um, it is great victory. There's no strategic importance to, uh, to, to Trenton. They don't have to hold the city. So they go, they spend a day there, they, they eat, they drink, they get warm, and they get out because they know that the British are going to respond. Um, but it was exactly what he needed. And so it's now December 31st, 1776. Most of his army goes home the next day and he's going to make his, his appeal to them. Washington is not an orator. We can count the number of times that Washington spoke, and it changed history on one hand. This is one of them. He, he calls up the guard, and he says to them, you know, he has something really uncharacteristic for him. He acts outside of his authority. Congress has just recently given him the permission to offer bounties, meaning I'm going to pay you a little extra to stick around. Um, he doesn't even, he doesn't know that they've given the permission yet, so he's kind of going beyond what he thinks he's allowed to do, and he offers them an extra month's pay if they'll re-enlist. And he calls for those who will re-enlist to step forward. The drums roll. And no one steps forward. No one. That's it. It's over. The army's gone. And then he speaks from his heart. He says this, my brave fellows, you have done everything I have asked and more than could reasonably be expected. But your country is at stake. Your, your, your wives, your homes, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with fatigues and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. If you will consent to stay one month longer, you will render that service to the cause of liberty and to your country that you could probably never do under any other circumstance. Again, he calls for those to step forward who would re-enlist. Again, the drums roll, and again, no one steps forward. And then a single soldier stepped forward, and then another, and another, and then there's this, there's this moment of confusion where people are making deals. I'll re-enlist if you re-enlist, and they start to advance by pairs, and then, in some cases, by entire companies. And most of the men who were scheduled to go home the following day will re-enlist. When Washington appealed to their own pecuniary interest to pay them more, no one was moved by it. But when he makes an appeal to their public virtue, suddenly, most will re-enlist. Public virtue is this idea that in a government that's of the people, by the people, and for the people, from time to time, every person needs to make an individual sacrifice for the good of the country. That when we go to, the, to vote, it's not just who will give the most to me, 
but who will do the best for the country? Uh, and this is the one that I think we've lost the most. Um, like if it's a like non-presidential election year, what, 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 what kind of percentage of voter turnout does it take for us to think it's been a pretty good turnout? About 30%. If we think 30% of the registered voters show up to vote in a non-presidential year, we go, that's pretty good. And then of the ones who show up, who actually took time to actually study out and figure out, can, to make the individual sacrifice to become an informed voter. This is a tough one for us. So as we think about this fifth of the lost founding values, what is it that you can do? It starts by, by becoming a really informed voter and making the, the choice not for who going to put more in my pocket, but who's going to do the right thing and the best thing for the country. Those are the founding values. And what it takes to be a great American is to embrace them all. It's my hope that we'll be able to do that this year as we come into the 4th of July celebrations. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you for that message. Um, one of my favorite things to do with my children, and I'm not always super consistent at this, is to be able to read individually with them in their scriptures. Um, my boy, McKay, is, um, he'll turn nine uh, on the 4th of July, actually. And uh, he's reading in the book of Alma right now. And uh, last night as we were studying, we're in Alma 48. And I just kept coming back to this example as, as Gov was presenting to us and this idea of um, Moroni preparing the minds of his people to go uh, fight against Malachiah. And uh, as I thought about that story that I was reading with McKay, I thought it's interesting that Moroni focused on strengthening the weak parts of the civilization. And uh, if we might say that there's maybe five things that we need to focus on weaknesses. And if we made those weaknesses strengths, then we'd be able to defend against the enemy. I, I love having this experience, just of having read it with McKay in, in Alma 48. The, the description of Moroni uh, and some of the similarities that we've been presented with today. This is verse 11. And Moroni was a strong and a mighty man. He was a man of a perfect understanding. A man who did not delight in bloodshed. A man whose soul did joy in the liberty and freedom of his country and his brethren from bondage and slavery. Yea, a man whose heart did swell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed upon his man. A man who did labor exceedingly, work ethic, for the welfare and safety of his people. Yea, and he was a man who was firm in the faith of Christ, divine providence. He had sworn with an oath to defend his people his rights, his country, and his religion, even to the loss of his blood. Uh, I'm thankful for the things that I've, I've learned today, not just from Gov, but from the, the Holy Ghost, personalizing my understanding of the uh, hand of the Lord in this great country, and to be able to look upon people like Moroni and other individuals in the Book of Mormon who have taught us so much about the importance of relying upon our great God. Uh, I, too, hope that in this uh, preparatory week of our celebrating our independence, uh, we will not only think about what it means to be an American, uh, but what it means to be children of our Father in Heaven and to be able to follow his teachings and his example, to be able to reach out to other people along their path. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will close by singing hymn number 339, My Country Tis of Thee, after which Brother Brian Storm will give us our benediction.
Our Father in heaven, we are so very grateful and humbled to be here this evening to hear the message which we heard. We're grateful for the guidance of thy spirit upon our founding fathers to, and those others that have been brought to this great land to uh, inspire them to fight and to uh, be faithful to thee in creating liberties that have allowed us to have freedom of religion, that we will be able to worship thee in a manner that would be pleasing unto thee. We're grateful for the words that have been spoken and the values that we have been reminded of. Help us to take them to heart and that we may uh, exemplify them in our own lives and to the lives that we come in contact with. We ask that thou would bless us with thy spirit and all that we do, that we may remember thee in all of our actions and deeds and thoughts. And we do this in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.